becoming a professional video editor is no longer a steep climb. Almost every non-linear editing suit offers a free trial or a free version. Um, I think it's a game changer that Avid Media Composer have launched Avid Media Composer first. And within a few months, we're also looking forward to a new UI altogether. I think all this is done to bring more first-time users into the fold. I'm Sabir Haq, Associate Professor at Mahe Dubai Campus. I specialize in broadcast journalism, filmmaking, and new media technologies. I have trained video editors for the last 15 years, and I hope that this training series will help you master Avid Media Composer. This training series is for first-time editors, for professional editors, and for students who maybe at a certain point want to go and get, get certified in Avid Media Composer. As an Avid certified instructor, um, I just want to ensure more first-time users are put at ease when it comes to Avid Media Composer. I realize online there's a very there's a lack of uh, there's a lack of training material when it comes to Avid Media Composer, and um, I think this series will help a lot more people to come in and join the professional community of Avid Media Composer. In this lesson, uh, we're going to go through the interface of Avid Media Composer. Uh, we're going to understand uh, the fundamentals of Kodaks uh, and what does Avid do with those Kodaks. Avid has its own native Kodak called DNxHD and HR. We're going to go through all of that. Um, I'm going to also show you what happens when you create a project and where does a file get stored. Similarly, we're going to see how we can customize the interface, map with the buttons onto your keyboard so all of that we will cover in this particular lesson. This is a brand new series which covers Avid Media Composer. I'm using the version 2018, although most of the materials I'm going to cover is from Avid Media Composer 8.6, as I'm a certified instructor for Avid Media Composer 8.6. In this lesson, we're going to cover Avid Media Composer interface, how to launch the software, the key components of the interface. We are also going to look at how to work with bins. At the same time, um, how to create uh, how to create a user profile and not only that we also show you how you can import your profile into another system that you would be probably working um, so that is something that you can always uh, give you a, a sense of interoperability that you'll not be limited to working with one workstation after that we're going to cover uh, what are avid projects um, and uh, then we're going to talk about avid codecs um, understanding this is very essential because that will give you a much better uh, a much better idea about what kind of media you're bringing in what kind of output you want from your project so we're going to look at uh, different codecs at the right codecs that you want need to choose as per your footage and we're going to and we're going to also cover uh, how you can create a custom project so there is an option for creating your own custom project specification where, where you can define the raster size and the frame rate and uh, after that, we're going to cover how to personalize your interface, so which means you can actually give it a custom look that you want for your, for your interface. And then we're going to look also how you can map the user buttons. So button reassignments from menu to your keyboard, all of that we're going to cover in this particular lesson. So this lesson is going to prepare you to launch the Media Composer with confidence. You'll know where things are. At the same time, I'm going to actually use a project so you can work along with me in the next lesson. I'm going to share the footage which I will be working with so you can work along with me. All right, so uh, here we are. Um, and when you open every Media Composer, if you do not have any pre-existing uh, project, it will not show up here. Let me just quickly go through the meaning of this particular interface. You have three buttons right here. Uh, you can choose your particular profile if you have one if you want to create one you can also create one from right from here we're not going to not going to do that now uh, the first button which is private is basically if you're working in one workstation and uh, you want Avid to define the location where the project will be saved then you can choose this one as you can see i'm using a mac so it's going to my user going to documents and going to the folder called Avid projects now this is only when you're working in your personal workstation and you want Avid to define where the project, project needs to be saved. Shared 
if you're working on a system where multiple people are uh, using it to edit which means it's going to be available to all the users who are going to be using your workstation in that case you can save the project in shared again this path and this location is specified by avid yeah external is when you want to specify your path your folder where you want to save the project now for this particular tutorial i have actually created a folder called lesson one and as you can see this is going from my hard drive here so i have a ssd and in the ssd i have created a folder and in the folder i have specified the folder where i want the project to be saved so that's what this uh, path basically means so in most of the cases you would like to choose external because you would like to specify the location where the project needs to be saved now i have already created a project called lesson 01.1 so let me go ahead and click on that this one gives you a snapshot of what specification my project is all about this obviously means that you should choose a project type based on the footage that you're getting now most of the footage i'm getting is shot in 1080p 25 frames per second and uh, the color space is RGB because this project is meant for web not for broadcast and this is the, the dimension of my video so that's what this basically tells you this this area right here um, this is not required for you now if you're working on a network you would require this we're not working in network so we don't need to look into here and let me click okay I'm opening a pre-existing project now as you can see um, this is how my interface looks like um, it's very standard like just any other software I have redefined some of the workspace I'm going to show you how you can save a workspace as well uh, and if you can see this is this is the heart of the entire media composer because here it lies your project window in the project window you can see I've got bins I've made some bins my bins are open so the project so the bins which are open you can see they're they are indicated by a little darker shade so media is open for me as you can see and so is sequence uh, music and stock footage is not open yet that is why it is light light gray volumes is something which you can create to archive so we will cover this sometime later settings is very interesting because every media composer provides you so many options and you can actually edit all of them and if i'm if i may stretch this window a little out a little bigger you can see that there are two kinds of settings user and project now user is something which is tied down to your user profile we're going to talk about user profile later but basically all this user settings is tied down to my particular user profile so i have a user profile called sabre hawk that's me whatever i change will be saved in this user profile and whenever i take this user profile and export it uh, and there's another way of doing it from your workstation uh, so we can pretty much take this setting wherever we want so that's your project window and as far as the uh, setting is concerned this is your effects so for your easy and quick uh, findability you can type and you can search for an effect it is organized uh, like transitions audio track effects and audio clip effects this filters are basically segment based filters and you can drag and drop it to a particular clip in your timeline format is what gives you the what you've chosen for your project and which is also reflected in your sequence as well so right now i'm using a project setting of 1080p and you can see other areas are here are grayed out so you cannot change it once you've selected the raster size interlace or progressive or you have chosen your frame rate color space as i mentioned before is something which you can define and usually it has a lot of options here but it is either ybr 709 or rgb 709 ybr 709 is for um, is for broadcast and RGB is for web something that you want people to watch your videos on laptop or workstations This is for 3d not required. Uh, I don't need to mask any margin here. So that is also an option that is available here. All right uh, Besides that that is this is your heart. Okay, this is your bin So whatever bins are open it will you can you will open up and I have clubbed them together that I also show you how to do that I have specifically opened another window here called effect editor which I feel that you will be using quite often once you get into an um, advanced stage in your edit. This is a composer window, this is your player, this is your record. So which means any clip I double click it will open up here. That's my player. 
and whatever is in my timeline is going to be showing up in this particular record monitor. They both have their own set of buttons. These buttons are unique to the player. These buttons are unique to the recorder. Some buttons are which is in the middle can be worked on on both. And timeline has got a lot of buttons. In fact, a media composer has so many settings that if you right click on any object, you will see specific settings on where you are at, where you are basically right clicking. So if I right click on my timeline, I get very specific kind of settings. If I right click on my bin, I get very specific kind of settings. If I right click on my uh, bins here, again, there are different options. Okay, so it's this software is rich with uh, its its features, and um, you can pretty much do a lot of things, uh, which is not available in any other software that I can tell you for sure. Right, so that's your interface. You have your project window, you have your bin window, whenever you open a bin, you have, this is my window, which I have opened up, okay? If you like what you see and you have changed certain, uh, like, you know, for example, a position of your windows here, you can actually save it as a workspace. So that you can do right here, window, workspace. Now I created a unique look for myself. So I call it Sabir MacBook, MacBook regular. I have another uh, uh, another workspace which I called as clipboard and if you want to suppose say for example look into some another setting which is what meter composer has defined for itself you can actually do workspace most common one is source record editing if I click on this you can see it's uh, it looks very different there is a source browser which is actually used to import and link uh, um, clips into your timeline and as you can see, it is up for you to change it the way you want it. I changed it to my requirements, so I have it as Sabir MacBook, MacBook regular. So uh, it's very simple how you can actually work on it. Um, let me just bring it here. And, right, and then I can actually save this as save current. So it will save it to Sabir MacBook uh, regular. At the same time, you have also option to delete workspaces. You can also have options to switch to any other workspace that Mac has created for you. Um, so all that is quite easy and that's, I think you already know by working in other non-linear editing suits. So that's your interface. Now let me just go through quickly how to work with bins. And let me open something which has got some clips. So when you double click, it opens in, in, its, in its own window and you can always drag to a tab and it will get connected to the particular tab. Yeah, so I can connect media as well here. So as you can see, or I can always click and uh, pull it out. So it comes out in its own window. All right. And as you can see, there's a so many options that's available that you can see to understand more about what this clip has in terms of its properties. And um, in a bin, there are three views. You have this list view. You have this frame view, which is again, great way to look at what kind of footage you've got visually. There's an important shortcut at this point that you need to learn, which is called Command L, which will make the size of the uh, clips grow bigger. And then you can always right click and you can write fill window. So it will fill according to the size of the present window. And here you can actually click on a clip and play and press the space bar to start playing. Audio rolling. Scene yeah. one. And as what Master we do in other softwares, you can also two. use JKL to play back and pause and play in reverse. So I can press K to pause. I can press L to start playing again. I can press L uh, many a times to make it play in fast forward. And I can press K to pause and so on and so on. And you can do this across all the clips. This is very handy and helps you to understand and see what footage you've got. In fact, the option to also mark in and mark out uh, without actually opening a clip into uh, into the player window okay which is great the another cool option is that if you if you press alt and double click it gets its own window okay this is a great tip uh, sometimes you want to have and compare between different clips so you can press alt and double click and you get its own window as you can see this window is self-sufficient with all the options and all the buttons that you will find in the player window as well okay so this is an excellent tip that you can actually use uh, when you're editing in order to compare clips outside one window. Um, you have also the script view where you can look at the playback something and you can actually add your own comments. Okay, so you can write something here. Yeah, you can write something here. 
and uh, this also is searchable so later if you want to uh, search something from your uh, footage you can find this clip very fast if you leave some comments which you can use often to look for a specific kind of footage not only that even if you are in the list view like for example here you can also do searching so search is available here right in the bottom if you follow my mouse and if i type cutaway i can find the cutaway shots right here uh, the only problem is there's no way to differentiate if you are in a search view or a regular view so always um, you know you look, look down and see if, if any search option is already clicked you can click on this crossbar to make sure that you go back to the original view and you see all the footage uh, we're going to talk about how you can uh, work with in a more advanced fashion uh, by importing and creating and adding uh, columns and how to sort columns okay that we're going to do later uh, but as far as bins are concerned this is what uh, we're going to cover a few things uh, if, you, if you close all your bins for example and you want to open all the bills and bins together into one window you can select all of them and right click and say open selected bin in one window and everything will open in one window which is great because that's what i want i want to see all the bins together in one window and then you can resize it as per the size of your interface yeah so here i can see um uh, I, I don't see the names because there are too many bins here. So you can actually click on this option right here and open and go to a bin. All right. Now let me go to a sequence because I've already created one sequence and my sequence is open right here in the timeline. And this is your timeline view. All right. So that's basically how to work with bins. And as I mentioned before, all the bins which are open, it will be grayed out. So if I close the sequence bin, and you can see it will already go back to light gray. All right. And you know that, okay, this three bins are open. This bin is not open. So that's regarding bins. Now let's talk about creating a user profile. All right. So let's go to settings. Okay. And you can see here that there is an option right here, which tells you what user profile you are currently in. So let me create a new user profile here so that I can illustrate where the profile is saved physically and what we can do with it. Now, if I create a new user profile, so it's option is here and it's going to ask me a name so i'm going to call it editor new and now i'm in a new user profile altogether and as you can see uh, the look has changed it's gone back to the default look okay so right now uh, this is how a default look um, when you create a new user profile looks like it, it takes you back to the media composer default interface look now let's see where this particular uh, user profile is created this I'm talking about without importing or exporting. I'm talking about pure finder level stuff. So let me go to my finder and I'll go to my shared folder, go to every media composer. And you can see there's something called avid users. Okay. And as you can see, this is the user I'm using uh, to log into my system. So it's Sabihak. And you'll find here that I have a folder called edited new. Now, this is the user profile that you just created. Now, if I just copy this folder into a USB stick and go to some another workstation, and I, in that workstation, I find the same location like I found it here, although it's quite a, quite a lot to remember. But always remember, user profiles are saved inside the shared folder of every media composer, inside the Avid users, and the, and the user you have used in to log into this computer. And you can just drop this folder right there you will find your user profile right here, okay? But you can also import and export. If you click on export, it gives you this option. Uh, there are three options, okay? One is if you're working in a network, so you will choose this option. If you do not want it to save and you want that, if you want to change a user profile in one computer in a network, then you can choose this option, or you can choose this, which is a standard like one that we're using now where you are taking from one computer to another computer, which are not part of the same network. So you can also uh, specify where you're going to export it by using this option. You can choose a location and you will get a folder after you export it. You just have to take a folder and import it wherever, wherever which com whichever computer you're going to work from. Okay. So that's your user profile. Okay. I'm going to switch back to my Sabir profile. And there you go. All right. So I got my uh, project back the way it should look as per my 
uh, settings all right so i'm going to close this project okay you can close the project by just going to your project window and closing your project window everything else will close and you'll bring it back to the first window where you can specify a new project so let's specify a new project let me save it in the same location where uh, my other projects are saved for now that's a part that i have specified click on new project and here you can actually give it a name so let me call it lesson 01 complete and here you can choose a frame rate if you have the latest version of every bit of composer the 2018 is what i'm using you can see that they have created setting presets for up to 16k which is like great you have 2k you have 4k you have ultra hd the difference between ultra hd and 4k which is quite confusing that a lot of people get confused is 4k is for theoretical release so that's why it's called dci but if you are creating a 4k project that's going to be broadcast on television go for uhd if you are working on a 4k project that you want a theoretical release like a cinema release then you go for 4k 8k 16k i'm sure you need to have very high end system but the most common one we'll be using is 1080 so 1080 as you can see there are a lot of options in terms of frame rate as well so you have frame rates up to 100 120 yeah and if you cannot find a setting here you can always go to custom the moment you click on custom you get to specify your own raster dimension the frame rate yeah and you can also specify your own color space where you've got a lot of options but if you do not go for custom and you go for a preset like i'm doing here now most of my footage is 1080p 25 frames per, per second so when i click on it as, as you can see i cannot change the aspect ratio nor the frame rate it is tied down to the choice that i have made here i can definitely change the color space so i'm going to go for rgb 709 because this project is primarily for web so if you are creating a custom project so say for example i'm, I'm creating a project for uh, instagram so i want 1080 uh, and i want 1080 because i want like a square dimension and i have a frame rate of 25 and i have a color space of rgb and i can save this preset i can call it instagram square so once i save this preset okay the moment i ever go back to my format here then besides all the options available given to me by evid i have i have an option called my presets and i can go directly to my presets so at any point in time you want to create your own custom project you can do that right here the other option that you don't need to bother for now for example film if you are if you are editing for a film which is shot in a film format you can choose this you can decide which uh, option you want to go for either the film was shot in 16 mm or it was in 35 mm with with four perforations or three perforations although this has become like a rare thing to do but i, I guess you'll be lucky i guess you consider yourself lucky if you're still editing on something which was shot on film and which you can edit and uh video composer is going to add like a custom number to each frame as per this setting you choose right here and which is going to be used by the film cutter to cut the film great if you're working in film unfortunately i'm not working on film so i'm not going to choose this option right here um this is something very very advanced given at this particular stage um if you are going to search in your project and you want the search data to be saved you can specify that particular option right here by default it goes to your project folder but if you want to specify another location to save your search views you can decide and choose it right here in every language it's called uh, sifting okay so all your sift data is going to be saved in this project folder but if you want to specify another location you can choose it from right here all right so that's creating a new project and for the sake of showing you how a project is created let me just go and choose maybe 720p 25 and using a color space giving it a particular name and i can click on okay and a new project is created and i can right right now select the new project and click ok to open a brand new project so understanding evid codex is going to help you a great deal so you need to understand as an editor as to what is your final output what footage you are getting and and what what codec you're using it to edit on so let me tell you in very basic there are three steps the footage you have shot with so you need to know what codec was used to shoot that footage are you going to are you going to edit using the same codecs the codec that it was shot on 
or you want to transcode and create another set of uh, another set of footage which will have its unique codec what we call as an intermediate codec and eventually after you finish your editing you're going to move it to what you you want to export to so what codec you want to export to so if you're exporting to a web codec it's something which is going to be helpful for streaming so you choose accordingly if you want to export it for a theoretical release then you need a codec which suits that particular workflow the standard codecs look like this all right now if you're shooting in hd then it is 1080p, which is 1920 by 1080, which we call as full HD. Then you have 2K. Now 2K, you understand that the aspect ratio changes, which means it is 16 is to 9 only when you are editing it in 1080. 720 is also 16 is to 9. But the moment you go beyond 1080, then you no longer are in 16 is to 9 ratio. So the 2K DCI, because again, this was again uh, created before 4K uh, and people wanted to use it for theoretical release. So it was called as digital cinema. So digital cinema primarily starts from 2K. And as you can see here, the aspect ratio is 1.85 is to 1. And the resolution is 1998. As you can see, the height of the frame remained the same 1080, but the width increased. So obviously it's much more wider than 1080. And then you have Ultra HD, which I've already mentioned is basically used for broadcast. It is 4K, but not really 4K. It is not full 4K. It is a smaller raster dimension than actual 4K. The exact double of 1080p is your 4K UHD because it is still having the same aspect ratio of 16 to 9. But when it comes to 4K flat or 4K DCI, it is wider than that. It is not 16 to 9. So theoretical release are always much more wider than your standard 16 is to 9 release. You also have option for choosing 8K, which is again twice the 4K UHD. So just for your understanding, remember when you are want to when you want to create something for digital cinema, which is going to have like a theoretical release, you are using 4K flat, 4K DCI. When you want to have 4K for TV and broadcast, then you're using Ultra HD, 4K Ultra HD, 8K Ultra HD. All right, that is going to be limited to television, not for theater. The next and the most important thing to understand if you're working with intermediate Kodak, these are Kodak which Avid wants you to edit because Avid tells you that these are Kodaks which are ideal to work in Avid platforms and Avid will ensure that you have a good uh, performance while you are editing it. Not many years ago, Avid would not allow you to edit until unless you have transcoded all your footage, whatever codec you shot into DNX HD. Now, Avid allows that, but Avid still has its own DNX HD codecs, which you can transcode, which means you're gonna spend a whole lot of time to convert all your footage you've shot into DNX HD. And these are your options. And as you can see, it is, it is, uh, the DNX HD ends with a particular number. That number is what we call as the data transfer rate. So if you're working in HD broadcast quality, you are primarily using DNX HD 145 because that's the standard uh, that's the standard bit rate, the data transfer rate. Similarly, if you're working for high quality, it is DNX HD 175 and so on and so forth. If you're working in cinema quality, you are working in 220X. Now, all this is going to put a lot of pressure on your system. So based on what system you have, what is the power of your workstation, you should choose this codex accordingly. There's another set of codecs which are very different from this ones. And those are five, five, or those are you, those are for actually working in 4K footage. And Evit calls it DNX HR. And as you can see, it is based on the compression rate. Okay. So DNX HR LB is a very high compression rate. And as you can see, the data transfer rate from 39 Mbps to 383 MP Mbps. And let's go to the very bottom, DNX HR 444. 444 is your color space, and this is no compression at all as far as colors are concerned. And uh, it has a compression ratio of 4.5 is to 1. And look at the astounding data transfer rate here. So obviously, you need to have a monster PC, a monster workstation to really work in really high quality. It all depends upon your final delivery. It depends upon how what you want to export to at the end of your project and at the same time what kind of workstation you're working with so based on that you can make all these choices okay so now we are back into the project and the last part of this lesson i want to cover by showing you how you can change the interface and uh, that you can do that by going to settings 
and you go to uh, option called interface as you can see right here and as you can see here you can actually change the way everything in your every media composer looks like uh, my primary highlight color is not purple i can change it to i can change it to any color i want okay and if i apply it then you can see all my highlight color has changed i'm going to go back to purple you can explore all the different options this will give you a lot of flexibility in redefining the way media composer looks like when you open it and when, now that was interface now when it comes to your shortcuts on your keyboard you can actually go to the keyboard setting right here okay you can double click this is all the keyboard um, these are all the keyboard settings that you have at the moment okay and you can go to your tools and you can open what we call as a command palette so command palette is where you can find all the settings okay you, every single thing that you can do in the software is available right here and I can just as simple as drag this button from here and drag it to any empty area that I have in any part of my software for example just randomly I want to drag this swipe camera bank okay um, not, I, don't, I don't even know what that basically means but say for example I want to just drag it down make sure you have chosen button to button reassignment and you can just drag it and drop it to any empty button that's how easy it is active palette is very interesting because active palette makes all these options active which means you can just say for example let me go to my media folder right here let me double click here and say for example right now my player window is selected i want to play back so i can just go to play i mean our command palette and i can play right from here and you can see this is working why is it working because i have choose active palette so that basically your you can convert any of these options into something real you can convert any of these options active by choosing go, going to active palette menu to button is also very interesting you can actually specify a button okay or an area in your in your uh, interface you can go to menu and say for example i want to give audio eq option right here the area i have selected here so i can choose audio eq and audio eq will come here so that's how simple and easy it is yeah anytime you want to change because i just changed to buttons right here i'm going to drag this empty buttons here so it becomes empty again and that's how easy it is so let me quickly repeat it anytime you want to change your keyboard settings open keyboard from settings all right open your command palette okay and you can you can drag and drop your buttons from command palette to your keyboard if you you can also drag and drop from command palette to your interface uh, you can use the active palette to convert all these options into an active button and you can also reassign area uh, re reassign options from menu to a button in your interface so that basically concludes lesson number one so you are actually now set to go and create a new project i'm going to give you all this footage in the next lesson and I'm going to show you how you can import footage, different options of importing footage and how you can begin and get yourself ready for the assembly edit. So if you really enjoyed this particular lesson and you want me to make more lessons, uh, please like, subscribe and share. And please provide your constructive feedback so I can use those feedback to make much better videos and much better tutorials ahead.